I'd like for you to turn in your Bibles, if you will, to the book of Acts, and we're going to start in chapter 18 today. We're going to be in chapter 18, and we're going to be beginning to read at verse 23, and we're going to go all the way through chapter 19 and verse 12. I'll read it to you. If you don't mind, would you please stand, because we always stand for the reading of the Word of God, out of respect for the Word of God. It's a Jewish custom. And it says in Acts chapter 18, verse 23, After spending some time in Antioch, Paul went back through Galatia and Phrygia, visiting and strengthening all the believers. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, an eloquent speaker who knew the scriptures very well, had arrived in Ephesus from Alexandria in Egypt. He had been taught the way of the Lord, and he taught others about Yeshua with an enthusiastic spirit and with accuracy. However, he only knew about John's baptism. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him preaching boldly in the synagogue, they took him aside, and they explained the way of God to him even more accurately. Now, Apollos had been thinking about going to Achaia, and the brothers and the sisters in Ephesus encouraged him to go. They wrote to the believers in Achaia and asking them to welcome him. And when he arrived there, he proved to be of great benefit to those who, by the grace of God, had believed. He refuted the Jews with powerful arguments in public debates. Using the scriptures, he explained to them that Yeshua really was the Mashiach. Well, in chapter 19, verse 1, we continued, and it says that while Paul, or pardon me, while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast, where he found several believers. And he says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe, he asked them? And they said, no, we haven't heard if there even is a Holy Spirit. And Paul said, then what baptism did you experience? And they told him the baptism of John. And Paul said, well, John's baptism called for repentance from sin. But John himself told the people to believe in the one that would come after him. In other words, Yeshua. And as soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Yeshua. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they all spoke in other languages, and they prophesied. And there were about twelve men in all. Then Paul went to the synagogue, and he preached boldly for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of the people became stubborn and rejected his message and publicly speaking against the way. And so Paul left the synagogue and, told, and took the believers with him. But then he held, public dis he held daily discussions at the lecture hall of Tyrannus. And this went on for the next two years so that the people throughout the province of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. And Paul and God gave Paul the power to perform unusual miracles. When handkerchiefs or aprons that had even touched his skin were placed on sick people, they were healed of their diseases. And evil spirits were cast out of them and expelled. Now, you can have a seat. I'd like to talk to you about what's going on here in these verses. There are some things going on that maybe are not very obvious to you at first. When you first see this story, you go, so what? There's a couple of guys going out and they're proclaiming the good news, right? No big deal. 
there's a guy by the name of Paul. We've been studying about him for some time now. We know who Paul is. But then there's this other guy named Apollos. And he was a Jew also, but he was a very good speaker. And he was traveling around, but he really didn't know the whole story. What he had heard about Yeshua made him very excited, made him very happy. He was a believer. But he did not know that God would also give His Holy Spirit to you to give you power after you believed in Yeshua. Now, who is the Holy Spirit? If you're Jewish, you're probably saying, well, what's this Holy Spirit thing? I know you think Yeshua is the Son of God, and you've got God the Father, but who is the Holy Spirit? Well, come on. Don't you read the Tanakh? The Tanakh speaks of the Holy Spirit of God 46 times in the Tanakh, or in what you would call the Old Testament in English, right? Many times the Spirit of God would come upon a prophet of God. And he would give that prophet of God the Word of God, Hadavar Elohim. He would give that prophet of God the words to speak. In the first of the book of Genesis we read that the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the deep. Before God did anything after He created the universe, but before He made any living creatures, the Spirit of God was there hovering over the face of the, of the waters, the deep, you see. So the Spirit of God is, of course, a Jewish concept. It's not a concept, He's God. God's Spirit was sent to the earth to do certain things. He was there at creation. He's there now after Yeshua has been raised by the power of God, by the Holy Spirit, as a matter of fact. He's there as Yeshua has been raised back to the throne of God at the right hand of God the Father. And the Holy Spirit has been sent to help the believers. He's here to help you and I. So this is not some new thing that's just in Habrita Chadashah. It's not just in the New Testament. It's in the Tanakh. The Tanakhi. It's very biblical, you see. And so Paul is asking the people, well, have you received the Holy Spirit? And they said, who's the Holy Spirit? He said, you believed in Yeshua, right? Well, John spoke of the baptism of repentance for sin. So we believe that we had to be forgiven of our sins by God, so we were baptized into the baptism of John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist was one of the greatest prophets who ever lived. It said in the book of Micha, or Micah, at the end of the Tanakh, that God would send His messenger before Him who would restore the hearts of the sons to the fathers and the fathers to the sons, lest God comes and smites the earth with a curse. And he said that his messenger would make the crooked path straight and that every valley would be lifted up, every hill would be brought low before that great and coming day of the Lord. And then when the Messiah came, John the Baptist came with him. He came there first. And he was, John was telling the story about this great Messiah who would come. And then one day Yeshua came to him and was baptized by him in Hayardin, or in the Jordan River. And John gave a witness and he saw the Spirit of God descending as if he were a dove onto the Son of God after he was baptized. Baptism, you understand now was a Jewish thing. You say, well, it's not Jewish today. Well, you're right. But who changed it? Because all of the sages of old, also in the Tanakh, also in the Torah, it talked about the mikveh, where a man would go down into the water, where he would cleanse his sins and come back up out of the water dedicated to the work of God in his life. You call it a mikveh. We call it a baptism. It's the same thing. You're burying the old man. You're coming up the new man. So why do we talk about these things like baptisms as if they're some Christian thing and a new thing? Where did the Christians get it? 
I'll tell you where they got it. They got it from the Jewish people. And so John was out there baptizing. In fact, the Pharisees, Hafasim, they knew that baptism was a godly thing. They came to be baptized of John also. And this was in the secular records as well as Haberda Kadeshah. It was in the New Testament, but it was also in the secular records that many, many people from Judea would go out to be baptized of John in the wilderness. Well, Apollos knew the story of John. And he knew that John was preaching to repent, to turn from our sins. And so John proclaimed this baptism of repentance, and Apollos only got half the story. He heard about John, he investigated it, he studied the work, and he began to believe in this baptism of repentance from sin, and he knew that Yeshua was the Messiah. But he did not connect the two together. Because Yeshua had said, I will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Okay? The, the Father would send His Holy Spirit to all who believe, and that the Holy Spirit would be upon you to bring you power to speak about the Messiah. To bring you peace in your life. To bring you comfort in your life. And to lead you into all truth. And to guide you. And to give you the words from God to say when you're asked to give an account for the faith that is in you. So Yeshua certainly spoke about the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has come and he's the comforter. He's the guide. who Hamadrich. He's the guide and he gives us hashalom, balev. He gives us the peace in our heart. And he leads us into kol ha'emet, into all of the truth. And he does all of these things. So now Paul is saying to these believers, well, what did you believe in? And they say, well, John's baptism. And Paul said, well, John's baptism was good. But John himself pointed us to the Messiah, Yeshua, HaMashiach Yeshua. And so they heard this and then they were baptized in the name of the Lord, Yeshua, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, not three gods, one God. Kol biachad. Anaknu lo yodim ech, aval ze kol biachad. Ze batanach, ze batorah. We don't understand it. We don't know how the three are in one. But people think that sometimes Christians worship three gods. Ze lo tov, ze lo haimet. It's not the truth and it's not good. We worship one God, the same Jewish God. Adonai Eloheinu. Ha-melech ha-olam. He is the king of the universe. ha The creator of all things. The Lord our God. And he is one. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu. Adonai Echad. Listen Israel. The Lord our God is one God. He is one. We believe that too. But we believe that he exists in a way that is so much higher than you and I can understand. Do you understand God? I don't understand him. And anyone that says they know how God exists, I don't think that person knows what they're talking about. Because God says, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts as the heavens are above the earth. And my ways are higher than your ways. They cannot be known. You and I are struggling to find out wisdom to live with. All wisdom is with God. His knowledge his wisdom is infinite. Do you think God looks like you? Do you think he's got this flesh and bones and blood and, and a body like this? The Bible says he does not. He is spirit and he lives forever. And the spirit is much more glorious than the flesh. You want an example? I'll give you an example. Today we're going to be talking about seeds. You know seeds. Hazirah. Zera ketana, a small seed, how it can grow into a big plant. Think about it. You have the physical life, the fleshly body, and then you have the spiritual life after this. And you say, well, that's kind of weird. Oh, no, it's not. It's in all of the world around you. It's in nature all around you. You take and you plant a seed in the ground. And it grows up into something completely different. 
It grows up into a big, beautiful plant, a big tree. How did that little tiny seed put in the ground, grow up into all of this big plant with all this fruit and beautiful flowers on it? How did that happen? It's the same way in our lives. You have the physical life and you have the spiritual life. But the physical life is just the seed, you see. And the spiritual life is much more glorious and grand and greater. You were created in the image of God. That means you have eternal spirit. You know, back in the Bible verses that we read today, we saw Paul is traveling around throughout the country and he's proclaiming the Messiah, Yeshua. But we also see that there's this other man named Apollos and he's doing the same thing. They're both doing the same thing. Well, some of the people would go, uh-oh, there's a problem. Because you cannot have two tigers in the same forest. You know, and some people think of it like that. Like, this is my territory. This is my country. If you want to do a work for the Lord, you go over there. But when people say things like that, I believe they do not understand how God works. They don't know that God uses different people with different gifts and He reaches people with different <coughs> methods. And so sometimes He will send several people there, maybe at the same time, maybe at different times. But He will send people with different gifts to the same place. Because God wants to reach the people who do not know Him. And so he will do everything that he possibly can to reach these people and let them know of his love. Some people now need an emotional experience at a congregation, at a church, at a synagogue. Some people need an intellectual experience. Some people need an experience that is a little bit emotional and a little bit intellectual. But everybody needs the Word of God. There is no substitute for the Word of God. You can have all the programs you want at your church. And you can have many, many things to do at your synagogue. But if you're not teaching the Word of God, God is not with you. He said, feed my sheep. He said, take care of my lambs. Tend my little ones. God has given His Word that we might know Him and that we might grow in Him and be fruitful to Him. He has planted us as a seed in this world so that we would multiply. That's why He sent Apollos there. That's why He sent Paul to the same place. Paul was in Corinth while Apollos was in Ephesus and then, I'm sorry, uh, Paul, uh, Apollos was in Ephesus and Paul was on his way and before Paul arrived at Ephesus, Apollos went over to Corinth which was part of the province of Achaia in Greece, in Lower Greece, what is Lower Greece today. Paul was going to go through the same city that Apollos had already been through. Paul had already been to Corinth before, so now Apollos was going to the same city that Paul had already taught at. Now at first, some pastors, some people in ministry would say, well, they don't need two people there, they already have one. But again, if you're thinking that way, you don't understand how God works, you see. Because some people have this gift, other people have this gift. Paul's life demonstrated the mighty power of God in the miracles that God would do, as well as bringing the gospel. But Apollos was into what we call apologetics. He wasn't apologizing. He was giving a reason. He was proving from the scriptures that Yeshua really was the Messiah. And so he was strengthening the faith of the believers and those people who had heard the gospel already. He was giving them a little more so that they would now become believers. And God sent both men to each of these cities. 
And so God knew what the people needed. He knew when they needed to hear the message a little differently. He knew when they needed to hear the ministry of Apollos, and God knew when the people needed to hear the ministry of Paul. So there was no conflict. There was no competition. They were working in the field of God. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about as we wrap up today's message. I'd like to talk to you about the seed and the sower. The seed, Hazirah. The seed, the little thing that we take and we put in the ground. Vigam Hazoria, the sower, the one who provides the seed and plants the seed in the ground. I'd like to talk to you about the seed and the sower. You see, God is in the business of planting seeds. You say, well, what are you talking about? God made the universe. Isn't it strange that in the account of him making the universe, Basefa Bereshit, Bepetachad, in the book of Genesis in chapter 1, it says that God created every seed bearing plant with its seed in itself. That's interesting if you think about that for a while. That means that he creates a plant from a seed. But that seed has in its genetic code the ability to make hundreds if not thousands of other seeds in the fruit of the plant that it grows up into. Right? So God makes seed that has the information inside the seed to make other seeds. And then when he made man... He gave, him, he gave him really the same sort of thing. We're able to reproduce and make more people. It's interesting if you are an English speaker, if you look in the Bible at what the word generation is in the book of Genesis, and God is talking about to Abraham, He's talking about, and in your seed will all of the nations of the earth be blessed. So it's the same thing. Men and women reproduce one way, and seeds reproduce another way, but God is into seeds. In America and all around the world today, if you live in a society that lets you start a business, if you're starting a real serious business, most people say that you should take some time and make a business plan. A tasarik tochnit. You need a business plan. Well, in the business plan, you tell about how you're going to reach your market, what your products are going to be, how you're going to grow, how it's going to turn from a small business into a big business, you see. And that's called your business plan. Well, God's business plan involves seeds. It involves seeds, and God has invested a lot in you and I by giving us a seed in our life. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But He's giving us these seeds in our life, and He expects these various people to go out into the world, His field, and plant those seeds. Now we know from the Bible that Yeshua said some of these seeds that we throw on the ground, if you're going through a field and you can't see every little rock and everything, some of these seeds are going to fall on good ground. And they're going to go deep down into the ground and take deep root. And they're going to reach the moisture. And they're going to grow up into a plant and bear fruit from that tiny little seed and they will multiply and have other seeds and as that fruit falls to the ground and the seeds get scattered then many many others of these plants will also grow up that's the way God multiplies the fruit you see but there was other seed that fell on rocky ground and it didn't have any way to get a root in the ground and so the Sun came up and it died then there's other seed that fell on the ground and the birds came and they ate it right away before it had a chance to grow. That's when the enemy comes and steals the word from somebody's heart. 
before it has a chance to take deep root and to grow up and be fruitful to God. And there's these other seeds that fell among the thorns and the weeds. And Yeshua said those are like the seeds that fell among the pleasures and the cares of this life. And the person would never come to the Lord and give fruit to the Lord in his life because he was too busy thinking about what he wants to buy next. He's too busy thinking about the cares and the pleasures and the temptations and the lusts of this life. So you have all of these different stories. You have all of these different options. You have all of these different possibilities, scenarios. But God has given us a great deal of the Word of God by using the illustration of seeds. He said Israel was his vine. That Israel was his planting that he planted them in the land. But that he came back at times and there was no fruit for him from this plant. And this should be fruit. If you plant a vineyard, you should expect to get grapes on a vim. And God was saying this in the Tanakh. Now there were people throughout Israel's history that were fruitful and they were men and women of God and they gave God fruit in their life and they told others about how wonderful God is. And those people were fulfilling what God wanted to do with the seed in their life. Because we all have a seed. If you're a believer today, you have a seed. You say, I don't have a seed. What do you? So I've just got my keys to the apartment. And I've got 20 shekels. And, that's, and I'm going to buy a cup of coffee with that after this is over. And that's all I've got. No, you have a seed too if you're a believer. You say, well, what seed are you talking about? I'm talking about the testimony. I'm talking about the story of how God saved you. I'm talking about how you have a story that nobody else has. A story about how God heard your pain. He saw your tears. He heard you calling for Him and He reached down and He rescued you. You have a story. That's a seed that you have. You can take and you can keep that seed all in yourself, but you will not be profitable to God if you do. Because you see, seeds are intended to be planted. Seeds are meant to be planted so that other seeds can be produced, so that they can grow and that fruit can happen. That's what God intended when He saved you. Think of it like this. You have a story that no angel can tell. What am I talking about? Well, angels haven't sinned. I'm not talking about the ones that follow Lucifer. I'm not talking about the angels of Satan. I'm talking about the angels of God who are before His throne day and night, who obey His every command. They don't know what it's like to be saved from sin. They don't know what it's like to be forgiven to have that heavy weight of guilt and sin and ugly evil lifted from your shoulders to where finally you can just take a deep breath and say I'm clean I'm at peace that feels good angels cannot say that story only man can bring that story only man can tell that story to other men with sin, you see. And God was very smart, wasn't He? He knew that if He showed you His love, He knew that you would love Him so much that you just had to tell somebody else who was going through hurt and heartache and pain. He knew that you could not keep it in yourself, but you would have to tell them about the marvelous work of God that saved you. So when you do that and you tell others, you're taking, in your, you're taking that seed in your own heart and you're planting it in the ground. And you tell another person and magically, miracle, miraculously, there appears another seed in your heart and God keeps giving you this seed to take and to plant in the lives of other people. To where after a while, at the end of your life, maybe you've spoken to 
10, 20, 30, 100, 1,000 people. We don't know. But these seeds have grown up. And they're now producing fruit to the glory of God. And God's name is being glorified now by the mouths of many who have heard of His mercy and experienced His mercy themselves. That's how seeds work. God is into seeds. God's business plan involves seeds. Now, there could have been a lot of competition. I think that if Paul and Apollos had come today the way things are, some people maybe in the city would have said, well, Paul, we already have a congregation here in Tel Aviv. We don't want you here. You'll steal our people. That always just makes me laugh. You live in a city with 2.4 million people living in and around the city. A hundred people go to that congregation and someone else shows up and you're worried that someone's going to steal your hundred people. Why worry about the one percent? You should be focused on reaching the 99 percent that do not know the Lord. If you carry the Word of God, if you're faithful in planting your seed here and here and here, God is going to have enough people for all the congregations that you can send. No problem. Get your eyes off of business and put your eyes on God. He will be faithful. If you feed the sheep that He gives you, whether it's five or fifty or five hundred, He will give you more. You must be faithful and feed them from God's Word. There is no other thing that can cause them to know Him and to grow in Him. But through His Word, it all happens. Now some churches will have emotional music. And the pastor will get up here and he'll be doing this. He'll wipe the sweat off of his head. That's okay. I have no problem with that. As long as he's teaching the Word of God. But if you take the Word of God out of it, then it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how good the music is. It doesn't matter how good the food is or whether you have free meals. It just doesn't matter. You're doing no good for the kingdom of God if you do not have the Word of God. And so it must always be centered around the Word of God. Some people need to hear Apollos. Other people need to hear Paul. Somebody else needs to hear maybe Lydia, the first woman who was brought to the kingdom of God from Europe. Now, not as a pastor, but she can give her testimony in the world and among the women and teaching the women. You have a seed to plant and God wants you to use that seed and plant that seed. You have a testimony. You have a message. You have a story that God has given you. And you never know what other people have gone through. Somebody else might say that they've heard it all and nobody has an answer for them until they hear your story. And then they hear your story and you go, wow, you went through the same things that I'm going through and God forgived you. You had all of this sin in your life but God still loved you. And He forgave you and now He's using you. Maybe He can use me too. That's the wonder of the plan of God. That's the miracle that He has put in place. In the same way that He told Adam and Eve. He said, now be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. He's doing the same thing spiritually. When He looks at you who have that seed, who are believing, and He's looking at you to say, now be fruitful, multiply, and fill my kingdom. How can you keep something like this inside of you? Why would you do that? Is it something that you just, you don't care about if other people are in heaven forever? You don't care about if people have their sins forgiven? Of course you do. But think about it. If you think about it, you're going to say, you're going to come to the conclusion that you should be sharing your story with somebody else. That you should be giving 
praise to God by multiplying and filling his kingdom with others. That's the way it is. That's the way he's designed it. But you see, some people only think of themselves. Some people don't think about other people. I heard the story the other day about three men who were playing golf. You know, the golf. Tiger Woods and all that. They were playing golf. Now, one of the men was a pastor. And one of the men was a doctor. And the third man was an engineer. But as they got up to tee off into the next green, they noticed some people out in the fairway and they could not start because the people before them were still there. So they waited a while, they waited several minutes. And these people were just going so slow, they were still there so they could never even get started. And they said, what's going on with those people? They are so rude. They're supposed to be moving on down the way and so that we can play too. And so after a while, the manager of the golf course just happened to be driving by. And the doctor and the engineer and the pastor stopped the manager and they said, listen, there's a big problem out there. And the manager looked and he looked out there at the people and he says, oh, it's them. And the guy said, well, what do you mean? And he says, I'll tell you who they are. It's a group of blind firefighters. <laughs> blind firefighters, they said, what are you talking about? He said, well, a year ago, we had a big fire here at the clubhouse on the golf course. And they saved our clubhouse, but they got involved in this big explosion, and it made all of them blind. So as a result, every time they come here, we let them play for free any time they want. Now the pastor said, oh, that's, that's really sad. He said, I'll say a special prayer for them tonight. The doctor said, yeah, of course. He said, and, and I have some friends who are eye doctors. I'll talk to them and see if he can maybe work on them and help them out. And the engineer was just looking down at the ground, shaking his head, and he looks up and he says, why can't they play at night? <laughs> Some people only think about themselves, you see. But you have to think beyond yourself. You have to think and look at the plan of God that God is using other people in His kingdom and you must be working with them. It's not a competition. God knows what gifts that other person has. He knows what gifts He's given you. And he will send this person at just the right time to talk to these people. And he will send you at just the right time to talk to these people over here. And you're going to be going back and forth. And your paths are going to be crossing as you work in the field of God. And if many more can hear the message out of 2.4 million people in Tel Aviv, that's wonderful. I had a friend, a couple of friends that have come to me over the years and they said, listen, would you mind if we planted another Calvary Chapel here in Tel Aviv? And I said, are you kidding? I said, look, I mean, we're getting to where we're almost filled up in this room, but there's two and a half million people in Tel Aviv. I need 10 more Calvary Chapels just like this. I don't even care if you call it Calvary Chapel. You can call it whatever you want. You can call it whatever denomination you want as long as you're teaching the Word of God. As long as you're feeding God's sheep. As long as you're taking care of His lambs. And I need you yesterday. So of course you're welcome here. So I think that sometimes we just need to not think so much of ourselves. Well, I need to ask you a question then. We talked earlier about how everybody who believes has a seed. Are you using your seed? Are you hiding it away? You know, the Bible has stories. Yeshua gave a parable about one of his slaves. A man had three slaves, three servants at that time. And he was going away on a trip. And one of the servants, who he trusted a lot, he gave him, he said, I'm going to give you these ten pieces of money. Each piece was worth a lot of money. He says, I'm going to give you these ten pieces of money. 
And when I come back, I want you to invest these so that you can give me my money with the interest that you earned. He brought another servant in. He says, I'm giving you five. I'm going to be gone for a while. When I come back, I expect for you to give me what you've earned in the interest. And then he gave one piece of money to a third servant. Well, he was away a long time, and when he came back, the first servant came to him and said, Master, I've taken the ten pieces of money that you've given me, and I've earned ten more. Here's your twenty pieces of money. And the master said to him, he says, Well done. You're a good and faithful servant. You're a good friend. You've been faithful in these things, and now I will make you responsible for more things, and I will make it very joyous for you to work in my service. Another servant who had received the five came to him and said, Well, Master, you only gave me five, but I earned five more in interest. I put it in the bank, I, I invested this, and I earned five more. So now here's ten instead of the five that you gave me. And the master told him, good job. You did great. He said, you were faithful in small things, and now I will make you responsible for much more, and you will be able to work in all the things that I'm doing, and you will be very happy in that. So they were happy. But then the third man came up and he unfolded this little napkin. He unfolded this napkin and he said, Master, here's your piece of money back. I, I did not know what to do with it. I was afraid of you and so I just kept it here all the time and I hid it away. And now here you are and so here's your money back. And the master said, you're an evil servant. I told you this. I was going to come back I expected to receive my own with interest but you did not even try you just hid it away and you did not do anything at all with it and he said take the money away from this man and give it to these men who already have an abundance in the same way God expects us to do something with the seed that's in us now you don't have to get wild you don't have to take a lot of risk, but you should share. I mean, I, there's people all the time that try to do crazy things. You know what I mean? I mean, you can't, you can't be bold enough for the Lord. You must do something bold. But you don't have to be a crazy person. You don't have to appear to be crazy to others. Just go out and share. God will open the doors. Just try something. Do it and see what God opens the door to. Now, you know what they say. They say that if at first you don't succeed, don't try skydiving. Okay? So, no. God will bless you. Keep working until you find the door that He is opening. A door may close in front of you. Another door may close and on your finger or something. But keep going and God will open doors for you and He will make a way for you to use the seed, your testimony, your story that He is putting in your life. Right? Just go. Just go. You know, a lot of people have already, what we say, broken the ice. A lot of people have come here and they've already started the ministries. 10, 20 years ago, it was very hard. People were getting attacked. Places were being burned down for teaching what we're teaching today. But a lot of other people came before you. And here you are, you have a story. And just remember, it's the second mouse that gets the cheese. The first one's going to get caught in the trap. But God has given you an open door. And other people now have already pioneered this way for you. What is stopping you from sharing the love of God with these people in Israel? God expects it of you. And you should expect it of yourself. It's the right thing to do. Just go and share the love that you received with others. Amen? Father, I pray today that these would receive boldness in your Holy Spirit. 
I pray that they would boldly go, that they would put fear aside and give their lives to you, Lord. I pray that everything that they do, that you would keep their hands on the plow, that eventually, Lord, there would be much fruit from their lives as other people would know you, would know your grace, would know your forgiveness and your love. I pray, Father, that these would be bold and win souls for your kingdom, that your kingdom may be filled, Lord. Thank you, Father. B'shem Yeshua. Animit Palel. Amen. Now, if you are here today and you don't have a seed in you, you don't have a story, because God has not saved you, because you've not asked Him to. You have not believed on the Mashiach that He sent to take the sins away from you. You can believe. He can put that seed in you today. He can put that story of peace and forgiveness in your life today. All you have to do is ask Him. Just pray after me as I pray this simple prayer. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I've been living for the wrong things. I've been living for physical things, trying to always think about myself. But Lord, I see that you thought about me. I see that you sent your Mashiach, Yeshua, to die for my sins. That if I would believe in him, I would not perish, but that I would have everlasting life. Lord, I want to live forever in your kingdom. And I pray that you would just come into my life. Use me. Change my life. Give me this peace that they're talking about. I want to know the comfort and everlasting life that they're talking about. Lord, I do believe that you are the Mashiach, that you are the Lord. And I give my life to you. Please make it into something that will bring you glory. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.